There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha gives up his will to live longer. He calls a meeting of the monks and says that he's going to live for only three more months. Then he gives them some teachings to hold on to. He says, without the Buddha there, they're going to have to depend on themselves, take themselves as their refuge. He asked them to remember among his teachings the most important ones were the Wings to Awakening, and then says, make yourself an island for yourself. Make the Dharma your island. And how do you do that? Practicing the four establishings of mindfulness, starting with the body and end up with self, your ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Or you can take feelings in and of themselves, the mind in and of itself, or dhammas, mental qualities in and of themselves, as your frame of reference. But the important thing is you don't just stop with the frame of reference. You engage in those other activities, being ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. This island that you build. It's not the other side. You're crossing a river, you get to an island. The river has the potential to flood, but you've got an island that's high enough so that even when it floods, you're not swept away. But it's a way station on the way to the other side. So what does it mean to practice these things and to make yourself an island for yourself in this way? Look at those three qualities, ardent, alert, mindful. Take in the reverse order. Mindful means keeping something in mind. Like right now, you're keeping the breath in mind. That's part of the body in and of itself. In other words, your body as you experience it right here, right now, without reference to the world. If you think of the body in the world, it's a matter of whether the body is good-looking enough or whether it's strong enough to do the work required by the world where it's going to rest tonight, where it's going to get food, those issues. Those issues, the Buddha says, just put them aside. Just take the fact that you've got a body right here, right now. You've got the breath right here, right now. So try to bring the mind to the breath. That's part of ardency. You're trying to create a step of concentration. There are people who say that mindfulness practice is one thing, concentration practice is another thing, but the Buddha wasn't one of those people. As he said, it's through the practice of right mindfulness that you get to right concentration. If you look at the factors of the path, the instructions for how to get into right concentration are there in right mindfulness. So you stay with the breath. You're mindful and keep it in mind. You also remember what you've learned in the past terms of the Dharma, about lessons you've learned about how to do this and how to do it wisely. Because this self that you're creating here, or the self that you're engaging in the practice of establishing a mindfulness, has three aspects. There's the self that's doing it, and there's the self that's going to enjoy the results as the concentration begins to grow. And then there's the self as the observer watches over everything. All three of these need to be trained so you can rely on them. Although it's the doer has to know how to stay with the breath, how to manipulate the breath in, a way, in such a way that you're not forcing it too much, you're allowing it to find a good rhythm. So it feels good breathing in and breathing out. Notice where in the body you seem to be most sensitive to whether the breath is comfortable or not. Recently I've been running into a group of doctrinaire people who say you have to focus at the tip of the nose and nowhere else, anywhere else, so you're destroying the religion, they say, which is pretty extreme. The thing is at the tip of the nose, there's not much in terms of pleasure or pain as you breathe in and breathe out. Those are the things you'll notice more down, say, in the chest, in the abdomen, the diaphragm, the shoulders parts that are really sensitive to how the breath feels. And if you can stay steadily with something that's sensitive like that, the breath will have to become more refined, 
more comfortable, because it's when you're not paying attention to the breath that it can get rough or harsh or restricted. So you want to stay continually. This is where the ardency comes in. It's one thing to be mindful. You can remember anything. You can be alert to anything. But ardency reminds you you want to re be mindful of things that would be really useful right now. And you want to be alert to what you're doing and the results that you're getting. So it's the doing. Then, of course, the enjoyer of the concentration is in those sensitive spots where you allow that sense of ease, the sense of well-being, to permeate as you make yourself more and more sensitive to this. So you really appreciate. You become a connoisseur of your breathing. And the commentator, that too has to be trained. In fact, of the three, that probably needs the most training, because it's your inner teacher. That decides whether what you're doing is good or not, and what can be done to improve it if it's not good enough. And then looking at the results, deciding what to do with them. As things will come up in the meditation, as the mind gets more and more quiet, things that you didn't notice in your own mind will become clear. It's like having had a flooded basement in your house. You finally get the water out, and as the water recedes, you begin to see items in the basement that you didn't see before because they were covered by the water. Now, the fact that they get uncovered when the mind is still doesn't mean that they're reliable. There is that belief somehow that whatever appears to a still mind is to be trusted. But again, the Buddha didn't teach that. His question always was, what's the most skillful use of this? Look at him on the night of his awakening. He gains knowledge of previous lives. There are other people who gain knowledge like that, and they say, well, this is good enough. I'm going to set myself up as a teacher. But the Buddha's question is, what is the most skillful use of this knowledge? The most skillful use he realized was seeing that his lives in the past didn't go up a stairway from low to high and then higher and higher and higher. They would go up and down go to very high levels of the heavens, and then you could fall very far and work your way up again and fall again. And sometimes it wasn't up and down, it was just erratic. So that was a puzzle to be solved. That was the most skillful use of that knowledge. So the next knowledge again was trying to figure out how this process did go up and down. He saw that peop people and all beings would die and then be reborn in line with their karma. And the karma was pretty complex. It's not the case that you do one bad thing, you go to hell. One good thing, you go to heaven. Because you're doing things all the time. Karma is your intentions. You can ask yourself, how many intentions have you had in the course of a day? You've had a lot. And the results of going from one lifetime to another is not simply a matter of adding up the good intentions and subtracting the bad intentions and seeing what number you've got. A lot of it depends on your state of mind as you die. But the whole process goes nowhere. It goes up and down and around and around, but it doesn't really accomplish anything. Nothing solid gets established. Nothing comes to closure. So that was the next question. What's the most useful use of this knowledge? Again, there are people who had seen this kind of process happening, gained knowledge of this sort, and again, set themselves up as teachers. But the Buddha said they didn't put an end to suffering. What would be the most skillful thing would be to learn how to take this knowledge and make it, make it lead to the end of suffering. That's how in the third knowledge, he realized that seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths and then doing the duties with regard to those truths would lead him out, would lead to the unconditioned. At that point, you didn't have to do anything more. In other words, the unconditioned isn't used for the sake of something else. It's, it's an end point. That's when things came to closure. 
So his quest was always, when things came up, when he gained knowledge of different kinds, what was the most skillful use of it? That's how his inner commentator kept him safe. So you take those lessons to heart. Things come up in the mind when you're meditating. You have to ask yourself, what's the most skillful use? Here it's good to have some advice from the forest of John's. And John Mahabu, excuse me, John Mun talking to John Fuan, who when he was a even when he was a young meditator tended to have lots of visions about devas and other things. I told him it doesn't matter whether a deva comes into your vision or what. The question is if the deva comes with a Dharma lesson or that lesson or the vision seems to teach you a Dharma lesson. Ask yourself, what is the lesson? And is it something that can be tested? If it can't be tested, if it's something that has nothing to do with getting your practice further along, just drop it. If it can be tested, ask yourself first, does, how does it fit in with what you know of the Dharma? This is where it's good to have some good background knowledge of the Dharma. As you remember, what is the Dharma for? What does it mean to practice the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma? It's for the sake of disenchantment, for the sake of dispassion. If you put this particular insight into practice, would it lead to dispassion? Or would it lead in another direction? If it looks like it will lead to dispassion, be helpful along the path, try it out and see what results you actually get. And it's in your ability to judge the results. That's when you have to learn how to be your own mainstay. That's your protection. Then there's the piece of advice that a John Mun would give to a John Mahabua. When something comes up in your meditation you're not sure of, whether it be right or wrong, good or bad, just stay with a sense of the knower. You're Basic awareness. Watch it come, watch it go, and you'll be safe. This is John Lee's advice. When something comes up, ask yourself, to what extent is this true, and to what extent is the opposite true? In other words, have a sense that different insights have their time and place. The Buddha himself taught only two topics or two points of dharma as being categorical, i.e. true across the board. One was the principle that skillful behavior should be developed and unskillful behavior should be abandoned. The other is the Four Noble Truths and their duties. Anything else is knowledge that's appropriate for sometimes, but not necessarily for other times. Always keep this in mind, because there are a lot of things that Especially when the mind gets into concentration, you get really confident that whatever comes up must be believed. You run with them much further than they deserve, much further than they can actually help you. So train that commentator, train the observer to be circumspect. Look at things from different angles. And you do that by being mindful, alert, ardent. As you put aside greed and distress with reference to the world, a lot of our ego that gets in the way of insights or spoils our insights has to do with our position as we see ourselves in the world. That's why the Buddha has you put those terms aside, so you can look more squarely at what's skillful and what's not skillful without reference to anybody else and what it's going to do for you in, in terms of the rest of society. And when you have that kind of independence, that's when you really can depend on yourself and you make it across the river. <laughs>